All right. Hi, everyone. Just uh, we're waiting a few minutes to get everybody to log in and join us. Good afternoon. Good morning. Hopefully, maybe some of you are grabbing your lunch, getting having lunch with us here today. I just finished my lunch. I'm ready for dessert after we're done this. <laughs> The, the the quarantine has definitely increased my dessert intake. <laughs> uh, baking as an activity with children has increased the accessibility of treats. <laughs> totally. We're stunt baking when we have yeah. to. All right, I'm just going to give it one more minute. That, you know, enjoy the awkward minute as you are all on mute. Yes, Wendy. Uh, oh, sorry, was somebody else stump baking? Maybe somebody else is stump baking and she was going to tell us about it. You can tell us later. We'd like to know. Um, that might be a, a separate topic we have to have a follow up on. <laughs> but just giving everybody a minute to sign on and we'll jump in. All right, I'm going to go. Uh, Welcome everyone, so glad you could join us here. Uh, for those of you I don't know, I'm Romy Newman. I'm the co-founder of Fairy God Boss. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be joined today by my friend, Lisa Colella. Lisa, welcome. Thank you so much, Romy. Great to be uh, here. If, if any of you don't know Lisa, she's the founder and chief strategist of Truist. Um, and she advises companies on their talent brand and their people experience. She's had incredible talent in places like TMP, Alexander Mann, and of course, Phillips. Um, and she is, has lived abroad and seen a place where family priorities and strong work life balance priorities is better than what we see here in the States. And it's inspired her to help us make it better here stateside as well. Um, so we're here to talk today. Uh, Lisa is really, I love bouncing ideas off you because you're such an enlightened thinker and you have really great visibility into what a lot of companies are doing and thinking. Uh, so excited to talk to you today about predictions of the future of talent brand. Um, but before we do, I did want to take a moment and just acknowledge the state of the world right now. Um, Fairy God Boss is a strong supporter of the Black Lives Matter movement and we absolutely condemn injustice, inequality, police brutality. Um, and so this has been a really profound and galvanizing and moving time for us all. Um, and so we just wanted to acknowledge what's happening in the world and take that moment right now. Um, so with that, I did, I'm going to uh, change tact a little, although I think it will be relevant to our conversation and talk about, you know, we've, the world has changed in, in the past month significantly. And so, Lisa, how do you think the key drivers of employee, what, what were the key drivers of employer brand before March and how have they changed or how have they stayed the same? Yeah, it's a good question. And, and before I dive into that, I also want to echo, echo Romy's sentiments. And I, I think you said it beautifully, but equally, my heart goes out to, to, to everyone at this time and especially those uh, affected by, by the racial injustice uh, that's happening. So, so please accept my condolences and empathy and, and hope for that. Um, to answer your question, Romy, you know, recruitment advertising has been around in some sense, right, forever, whether it was just posting wanted ads literally on store doors. I think really what drove the shift to a more strategic profession called employer brand was uh, in response to the power starting to shift from the talent to the employers looking for that talent. Um, and so employer branding emerged really as a way to create differentiation, right, for, for, for employers. Um, and, and, and in a way needing to help those employers both get the talent they needed, but also keep them, them happy. And in doing so, help them achieve successes and differentiation within their own industries. So in that sense, I, I, I think the drivers have more or less stayed the same. The, the, the need is still is doing work that helps employers differentiate themselves to win the talent they need. Although certainly that, 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 that shift of power <laughs> has started to cycle back to employers with more people out of jobs. Um, and certainly, I think from, from an employer branding space and practitioners you know, doing the work right now, tactics that we're seeing are starting to be more focused on preserving brand reputation and communicating about a brand's values and what they stand for as an employer, more so than, say, generating loads and loads of applicants. So I think the tactics have, have certainly shifted. But bigger, bigger picture, 
I think the crisis, I know when we started planning this, it was focused on one crisis. Now we're talking about multiple crises. Um, and certainly in the wake of both of those, if not more, it's heightened our level of responsibility, quite frankly, um, in the talent brand profession. I feel like now more than ever, we have to champion the voice of talent during these tough times um, and use some of these shifts that the, the universe have kind of dropped on our lap, use it as a platform to correct certain imbalances that have existed between uh, talent and employers for a long time, whether that be more about inclusion, whether that be more about quite, quite frankly, ma employers mandating certain working conditions that really aren't adding a lot of value. So it feels like there's starting to be more opportunities for us to, as, as employer brand professionals, to, to join center stage as strategic partners to business leaders, um, more so than kind of being relegated to the, uh, to the backstage cost center. So I do think it's our duty to step into that spotlight with, with confidence, with conviction, with impact to help people not only get back into work for those that might be in a situation of loss, but also help everybody navigate this work life, you know, bleeding together that's really come. So in a way, it's almost like we're, our, our role has shifted to workplace experience design, where we're, we're trying to help leaders structure workplace environments that are more suitable to the, the wants and the needs of talent in, in today's day and age, so. I think that's a really interesting sentiment. And uh, I think everyone here would like the ability to articulate that to management and kind of in, increase their influence. So as somebody who way back has looked for jobs, it's been, it's been like longer <laughs> than I wanna know. Um, certainly one of the key things I evaluated was the office space and the facilities and um, and that has been a real differentiator, especially as, as kind of the tech boom has happened. So now we realize a lot of companies are going to be virtual or more virtual than they've ever been. Um, is that gonna change the way we think about talent attraction, both in terms of features and benefits of the workplace, but then also maybe the, the scope of the, of the geographies we're recruiting from will change? Yeah, you know, it's funny that the option to recruit from a more national or international skill set has always been there, you know, for business leaders. It's just that the pandemic has kind of dissolved this illusion that local office based workers equate to control and productivity. Right. So, so all of a sudden the risk versus reward equation has drastically shifted and so different choices um, are being made, um, rightfully so. So to answer your question, yes, I think the, the pandemic has certainly opened leaders' eyes as to what's possible when it comes to physical location of talent and, and what some fears are uh, not likely to actually become realities that they may have had in the, pre in the past. Right, it's um, not as bad as everyone thought. <laughs> no, and, and, and you know, quite frankly, executive teams are seeing the commercial benefits, so why not, right? <laughs> um, I think where it becomes a little bit tricky in, in the talent branding space or, or the employer branding space is that we need to think about the ripple effects of, of those decisions. So, you know, one is proportionate expansion of budgets, for example. It's, it'll be really challenging for employer branding teams to do what they do if all of a sudden they're working with budgets traditionally formed for localized recruitment initiatives, right? Targeting a, a marketplace within 25 miles radius of X location, and all of a sudden you're opening up to a national search. Um, so I, I, I think online global um, communities like yours will be increasingly important as go-to-market channels to reach talent that is more remote, that is less confined by geographic constraints. Um, but really key to solving this in a kind of follows some of my previous comments is having employer brand managers and, and people who do that work have a seat at the table so that as these decisions are being made it's being looked at holistically and and the action versus reaction consequences can be weight can be weighed and we're not looking at it in silo great um so clearly fairy god boss is all about helping companies build diverse uh Tech workforces, both in terms of female and underrepresented minorities. So as, as companies are thinking about their talent brand messages, how do they relieve bias and attract job seekers of all backgrounds? Yeah, yeah. To me, it's not about the message. <laughs> um, it's, we've long talked about this space and so in sort of what are you communicating? What's your content? And 
we're getting to a point where um, we've known it for a while, but now there's no choice. It's not about the message, it's about the actual offering, right? And, and the paradigm shift that's required for companies and brands to think in terms of let's design truly inclusive offerings versus selling non-inclusive offerings in a way that sounds inclusive, <laughs> if, if that makes sense. Um, and, and to just create, a, I think in metaphors, and we were just talking about dessert before this call. So, um, you know, if I'm trying to lose weight and someone's trying to sell me on a low fat chocolate, you know, it might sound like it's better than an alternative chocolate bar, but it's still chocolate, right? It's not gonna meet my goals as much as a fruit salad with or something else. So I think it's important that, um, leaders, companies, employer brand professionals, whatever team is working on these sorts of issues are able to create an inclusive proposition. And then the messaging just falls into place because by nature of doing that work, you know, you're already going to have something that best meets the need of your audience, whichever segment of the workforce it is. And, you know, is, is an opportunity to be inventive about it. Yeah, I agree. And I would just observe that in our experience, What's most important is evidence that someone's trying, right? So it's not about being inauthentic and it's not to say that you can't, you can't attract diverse talent if you haven't made it far on the journey. You should still be trying to. You should have to be transparent and authentic to say, here's where we are and here is how we're investing and, and making an effort to make a real difference. I think that's a great point. I, th I think where we've we're starting to mirror from a professional sense where I think, you know, personal kind of mainstream has gone, which is this notion of embracing progress over perfection and having the, the, the elements of vulnerability be seen as actual, actually a positive and credible and more trusting than trying to make it seem like you always have it together all the time. Um, I think also we're start as, as personal and professional lives are starting to blend together more like, Everyone in this call might hear my five month old or my two and a half year old wake up at any time, which I've never had to face before. Um, but as these worlds start coming together, so too I'm finding language, uh, human language entering the professional space a lot more. So, you know, I, I don't remember ever seeing words like, you know, empathy and well being and joy. In, in career sites and corporate newsletters, and all of a sudden you are. Um, and it's important that, that um, we're able to reflect the reality of what's going on regardless of you know, home, workplace. I think you and I had, had a couple of examples when we were planning for this, and I think you brought up the you know, topic of, of employee engagement and, I, and very well-known, understood corporate term. And I'm like, what if we talk about, about bringing joy to the workplace? And it's kind of the same thing, but it sounds different. It sounds more inclusive and it sounds more warm and welcoming. So I think we'll start to continue to see more of the tone change and reflect some of those ideals as well. Right, and, and important for people to really acknowledge that the most forward thinking talent brands are talking about empathy and wellness as, as um, they're not just aspirational, those are table stakes for a lot yeah. of potential job seekers. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, to, to ignore, to try to compartmentalize anymore is no longer just not a forward step, it's actually seen as a, a, a negative a backward step of, of kind of being tone deaf, if you will. Yes. All right, so let's come back to the, the physical office that none of us go to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, how, how, one thing they did was sort of help us actually show our, our values. You could, you know the difference between a cubicle farm and a beautiful campus and that says something about your talent brand, but how now we don't even have candidates coming through our physical office. So how can you um, replicate that experience of articulating and, and creating the, the, the personification of your, of your culture? Yeah, right, rethinking everything overnight. <laughs> um, in my opinion, there are at least two components to this. The, the, the first is technology, you know, for sure. And the second is the content that gets delivered through the technology or who's behind it. Um, Right now, I'm exploring a lot of uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, uh, you know, solutions for brands that I work with, even looking at how technologies from other industries like real estate um, can potentially give candidates that experiential view of, you know, what it might look like, it, it, assuming that their future experience will be office-based. Um, I also believe coworkers and managers are physical manifestations of any, of any talent brand, um, and that video conversations can deliver at least 80% of um, 
critical information and establish some sort of connection or lack thereof to, to be able to help candidates make those decisions. Um, but you know, video interviewing, these sorts of things have been around for a while. They just are now having to be leveraged more. It's not a choice anymore, right? It's 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 you have to be able to to present that. And you know, we've joked with uh, some leadership teams of things we've been talking about now for three years that said couldn't be done within you know a year. Now all of a sudden we've conveniently gotten and been able to do in two weeks. So sometimes you just need that little push. <laughs> little nothing like a little emergency to get things going. Um, let's see. So let's, you know, what, what skills do you think everybody should be investing in? If you're, if you're a talent brand professional, how do you, how do you get the seat at the table and what are the skills that you need? Yeah. You know, I don't think, I don't think the hard, the, the hard skills have changed a whole lot, to be honest. You know, I've, I've always believed that a strong marketing skill set or, or communications background is baseline requirement for for being successful in a talent branding role. Um, and then the nuances of HR and talent can be taught. Um, I think the talent branding teams who have the, that as the basis of their DNA are, are, tend to fare better than those who are you know, HR recruiting professionals um, by nature, just plopped in and, and asked to do the work from day one. But I do think now more than ever in, our, in this profession as well as others, soft skills are, are certainly more important and things like the ability to turn ambiguous situations or uncertainty into um, you know, tangible results and opportunity is a big one. So how to, how to establish a baseline of you know, here's where we need to go and have it be a flexible system um, and being able to, 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 to have that skill set is important. Also what I call connective thinking so the ability to make unique connections across things and ideas that um, were previously unconnected into this space. And I'll give you an example. So uh, I was talking to a client last week and, and they were trying to figure out how to, on the on topic of return to work, how do we structure an experience um, or an offering that helps employees with their re-entry back to the workplace in a way that's not scary or unproductive and how do we navigate that, right? And it was, as more we were talking, it was all about experience improvement. And the funny part is their whole business proposition is designed more in the healthcare setting, but around experience improvement. And I said, why don't you just lift and shift what works for your commercial teams and apply those to this space and use the same tools, capture feedback, create that they, you know, the same processes. So it's the ability to say, this worked over here, let's kind of plug and play and repurpose over here. And lastly, as you say, the ability to influence upwards, um, you know, really sees the opportunity this creates to be able to, um, you know, bring business cases to the table, speak with confidence, um, you know, drive innovation and, and gain the credibility um, to be able to influence what um, those in other departments or teams are doing. I see someone raising their hand. Yvette is raising her hand, but I actually don't know how to give you the ability to talk. I'm going to see if I, oh, let's see if we, okay. Yvette, uh, I'm trying to unmute you. I think you may have to unmute yourself. See if you can. And if not, I'm going to ask you to type your question. Oh, yes, you should be able to talk now. No? All right. Uh, I can't seem to make it work, Yvette, but if, uh, let's see. Uh, I can also read, um, I, don't, I think you can too, row me the chat. Bar, so, so I was going to um, say, if you want to just drop it in Q and A, we can take your question from there. If we can't seem to make it work, uh, apologies. But feel free to drop it in Q and A. Um, and I was, I actually, Lisa, I was going to come back to something you said because I think it's, it what was I love this idea of taking what seems like an ancillary practice, employer brand, and making it reflective of your core business. Like we. Hey, we do we do experience here. We do marketing. We do problem solving. How do I make sure that our employee outreaches, our talent outreach, is reflective of our day to day business and in incorporates the, our own best practices? Right, right. Um, so speaking of, <laughs> I have a question for you, and I love your answer. I'm gonna let you say. On this, uh, since I said best practice, what what are there some best practices you can share? <laughs> You know my answer to this, but I know it's it's important because this question gets asked all the time. I don't love the term best practice. I don't even like it. To be honest. Um, 
I think it's the, the beginning of complacency and non-innovation um, because the goal shouldn't be to mirror what worked well for another company. It, it, it should really be to, you know, innovate based on the reality of yours. Um, so certainly there can be learnings leverage, but, but I feel like it's, it's far too often used as an emotional crutch, um, especially in the corporate world. Like, like as long as I refer to my solution as like, this is best practice, it's okay if I don't, if I don't reach the goals or, or whatnot. Um, so, and certainly in this context, we're living through unprecedented times. So there are zero best practices out there <laughs> available yet, at least. Um, anyone who claims to have one is probably either lying or trying to sell you something from, from my opinion. I do think there are some fundamental values and mindset characteristics that are making some companies, you know, more successful at navigating this than others, for sure. Um, I think those who have come to a place of acceptance of this is what it is, right? Instead of trying to be like, oh, I'm just not going to do anything and hope that we go back to the way it was, you know, in two hours. I mean, they're not faring well because they're not actually accepting of here's what it is now. What's my next best move? Um, I think those who are finally managing talent with the same level of focus and investment, um, you know, and innovation around um, talent as they are with their have with their customers for decades are seeing success. Like I said, kind of kind of plugging and playing what's worked in those spaces. Um, and I think those who are willing to either find internally or hire externally, you know creative thinkers, you know, folks like myself who have been in this a while. And while we've not seen this particular recipe before, we're used to combining a bunch of ingredients and making, you know, great solutions from it. So um, ultimately, it's those who are kind of managing this as in reality, in real time as the marathon that it's going to be. Um, but I think we're, we're just in a, a giant case study right now, you know, and uh, which is kind of cool and exciting, I find that so, some find it a little daunting. But um, you know, I think best practices on how to manage talent strategies during a global pandemic will, you know, be available at some point, but not yet. Maybe around the same time a vaccine comes out, who knows? <laughs> yes, and then ho hopefully we won't need it anymore. And hopefully, yeah, and we never have to go back. <laughs> uh, let's take some questions from the audience. Uh, Wendy is asking uh, for some examples of companies that show inclusive offerings best. Are there any you want to throw out? I have some ideas too. Yeah, why don't, why don't you start, Romy? I've done a lot of talking. <laughs> yeah, so, um, a lot of we work closely with Cisco and I think they, they do such a good job presenting a 360 degree employer brand that starts fundamentally with the idea that we want employees who are different from each other in every way. And it's really fundamental and you, it comes through in all of their messaging and it's really holistic. I find that their, their approach has been really thought leading. Yeah, I found, um, I almost separate this into two categories in my mind. Cause again, I've not really seen one company that does both well in terms of the companies that are coming up with the truly creative, unique propositions. I think you find a lot of those in the tech spaces. A lot of the tech companies have had to do very kind of groundbreaking things like, you know, unlimited vacation time for wellness, you know, um, year long parental leaves to kind of promote family health and well-being. So they're kind of bold in terms of setting new precedents, particularly in the US. Um, and then there's companies that just have really great communication uh, strategies. So what they're talking about isn't necessarily you know, super unique and different or groundbreaking, but how they're talking about it and how you're, they're giving the experience of what is, is actually, you know, quite beautiful and, and well done. And so examples, um, you know, Dell, Netflix, um, I'm making it fill up. So there's, there's definitely, you know, those that are out there that are doing a lot around communications. But I do think as a whole industry, we need to be championing more of the actual changes to the, to the offering than just to focus on the messaging. I agree. And I, I think, uh, we spend a lot of time looking at career sites and there are several that have stated goals. And I think that willingness to go out on a limb, state goals, share metrics is really um, putting, you know, it shows a company that puts themselves on the line. Absolutely. Yeah. I think, yeah, like we talked about, it's even if you're not, you're never, I think it's re this reality of you're, there is no finish line. You're never going to be at a finish line. So let's, you know, talk about the journey and keep everyone updated as to where they are. And I think this, element, I think also kind of a silver lining with, with some of the crises going on is this element of humanism is just starting to become pervasive again, both in the workplace setting and outside of where 
people realize that there is a humanity, you know, and, and companies are, are quite simply just composed of humans who are not, who are, who are not perfect, um, but, but hopefully doing the best they can every day with the best of intentions um, and, and kind of celebrating and supporting those successes, but learning from, you know, failures too with, with an element of humbleness. Absolutely. If you have other questions, please, we'd love to take your questions. So go ahead and drop them in Q&A. Here's another one um, from an anonymous attendee, and I'm going to try to parse it a little. So it's an umbrella organization with a multitude of supporting brands, and they manufacture and design furniture. They're thought leaders, as you kind of said, like they build, they are thought leaders on the new workplace, which is a great opportunity for employer brand, but they're just getting their EB strategy off the ground. Um, would you give them any advice on how to connect their employer brand to their core, their core brand, the brand connection to their employer brand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think it's really important that the two are synergistic, right? A corporate brand and an employer brand. And, and quite frankly, it's one brand to the outside world, especially if in your, you're in a retail space, like it sounds like um, in this example there is. So it kind of depends on how far along the corporate brand is. I mean, if it's still in its infancy and you have a chance to influence that and, and approach all of your audiences together, right? We're capturing input from customers. We're capturing in front from talent, which actually is sometimes are one and the same. And this is kind of what we stand for to those audiences. It's best if you can parallel track that work. If not, sometimes the ship has sailed, right? And so you're kind of now building the employer brand side of it. But um, I think first you need to understand your audience from a talent perspective. So what are your target audience segments? What is it that they are looking for? What are their needs? What are their wants as it relates to careers? And then understanding where does that intersect with our brand values, right? So, so if, if you happen to find out that a certain segment of the, the talent market that you're going after really values you know, workplace flexibility, um, whatever that looks like to them. And one of your brand values happens to be, you know, caring. How do we then translate that element of caring into a benefit that speaks to the desire to have flexibility? So it's really, um, Romy, you know this, I, 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 my brain works in Venn diagrams. <laughs> so kind of take your talent insights, overlay that with your brand values, and then you kind of have the substance to uh, a foundation from which to, you know, build your employer brand uh, platform and architecture and messaging and all that. And I would add that I think then getting it into the words, getting it to be told through the, the mouths of your current employees. Absolutely. Having their, their referrals, their true voices presented makes a big difference too. Right, there definitely needs to be that internal validation too. I mean, the, the whole grow, goal of employer branding is to amplify the reality, right, of your organization and hopefully influence that to be an ever-changing continuous improvement journey. Um, but yeah, absolutely comes from the inside out and amplifying the voices of your people of things that you're already doing and in a way that the external market wants to hear about. Great. We have another question. Somebody owns a production company focused on employer branding content and building career sites. How do you see content strategies evolving with the work from home situations now and for the foreseeable future? Do you think everybody's going to have to renovate their, their company websites? I think... Um, I think everyone needs to completely Marie Kondo <laughs> their, their talent experience, their candidate journey. Um, so much of what worked even three months ago is it just feels outdated, whether that be how you keep um, candidates and employees up to date on the latest, you know, COVID news and announcements is just updating a static web page once a week. Is that really meeting the need or do you maybe need to have real time, you know, chat available to, for people to ask what questions are, are burning in their minds? So I think one thing I would suggest to everybody on this call, if you've not already done so, is, is really go through the whole candidate journey into the employee journey if, if you manage employees uh, as part of your remit and, and just unapologetically get rid of and fix what is no longer fit for purpose in the current reality. Um, because uh, from a content perspective, I mean, that, that's one piece of the puzzle. Obviously, people are being a lot more thoughtful about content. It's difficult to you know, have a year long calendar and not and be rigid against that because you don't, you certainly don't want to sound tone deaf and send out messages that are ill timed and so forth. Um, I don't think the channels have changed too much. You know, there's still a heavy reliance on social and career sites and all of that. But I do think um, how that message gets conveyed, what tone gets conveyed, the timing of the messages, 
all needs to be looked at through the lens of current realities and not just assume that, you know, everything that's worked in the past is going to work moving forward. I think we're up against time. So just before we hang up, uh, and I really want to thank everybody for such great um, participation and such great attendance. But uh, what are if we, uh, you mentioned Marie Kondo, and I know there are two more. What are what are three things everybody should do right now? Uh, if you if you're a talent brand practitioner, what should you go do to manage this new normal that we're all living in? Well, just if you're a human being, take a deep breath. <laughs> oh my goodness! And I don't and, and I and laughter is kind of my defense mechanism. I don't mean to make light of anything that's going on, but really, it's is try to just take a deep breath, get into a marathon mindset. Um, you know, there's not going to be a silver bullet where tomorrow it's like, oh, I got the answer and I'm good to go for the rest of the year. You know, setting up yourself in a system that allows you, you know, that as the details around us change, you have a continuous improvement system in place that you can go back to. Um, you know, that's the best thing that you can do um, in terms of staying relevant, but not killing yourself, trying to keep up with everything the second something changes around you. Um, uh, like I said before, I think just really take a look at the holistic end-to-end -end candidate journey and and prioritize what needs to go entirely, what needs to be replaced, what just needs to be tweaked. And and lastly, I would say this is your opportunity. Ask to be part of the return to work conversations. Um, you know, input to the solutions that are be being designed right now as we speak, um, instead of being forced to market. You know, whatever comes out of those conversations. So so the the more proactive you can be, the better handle of you know, what you'll be able to do in your job, but also I find it to be the more meaningful and purposeful work that we really have an opportunity to dive into right now. Yeah, this is a moment for talent brand to become really primary to many organizations. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, Lisa, always so enlightening to spend time with you. Thank you for being with us here today and thanks to everyone for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Romy. Thanks everyone. Take care, stay well. <laughs>